we're going to cover the page of notes that we weren't able to cover last class about adaptations. In past science classes, you've probably talked about adaptation before. Adaptations are simply features in a population that increase the chance of survival. On your assessment today, when you're given certain adaptations, you use logic and reason and what you've learned about plants and animals in past years to decide what is the advantage to having the specific trait. What is it helping with? So we're just going to go through some examples of a few adaptations before you take this assessment. Let's take a look at polar bears and let's think of the features of the adaptations that help them survive in a specific environment, which is a very cold climate. One thing that we know about polar bears is that their hair is not white, it's actually clear, and they have black skin. So let's think about the advantage to having these adaptations or these traits. The fact that their hair is clear means the light can shine through their fur, their hair, and then it contacts their black skin, which then absorbs the, the radiation. So it warms them up. So that would be the advantage or what these features would offer for an organism that has these features in these colder climates. One thing that we notice about fish is that we always see kind of a dark backside with a light underbelly. Well, this coloration is an adaptation for aquatic organisms. Whenever you go swimming, if you look down, like go underwater and you look down towards the bottom of a lake, it looks dark. So an advantage for a dark back is whenever a predator is above the fish looking down, then the black backside of the fish is going to blend in with that dark environment, the bottom of the lake. If you think about swimming underwater and looking up, it's going to look lighter. And so a lighter underbelly is less likely to be seen whenever a predator is swimming below and it's looking up towards a lighter backdrop. So those fish that have the lighter bellies and the darker tops were the ones that survived better and reproduced. And now all the offspring that are born have those traits. They have the alleles for those traits. Let's take a look at rabbits here. And we know that desert rabbits, they have long ears. I asked in my previous class, what is the advantage of having long ears? And some students said to hear. Well, if longer ears allow them to hear better, then wouldn't our rabbits here in the Midwest also have long ears? But that's not the case. The real advantage has to do with regulating body temperature. And the fact that these are living in hot environments, those big ears allow these rabbits to release heat into the environment as the blood circulates through their ears. Then the blood carries heat, and that heat can then be released from the rabbit into the environment. So those with longer ears in these hot climates, they're surviving better and they reproduce than rabbits that have shorter ears. So that's why it becomes an adaptation in that population or becomes more, and co more common for them to have longer ears. In colder climates, we also see that those that are very short Like in plants, we see that dwarf plants survive better in colder climates than taller plants. Because if you think, the higher you get away from the earth, the higher the, the wind velocity. So that would lead to higher wind chill. Organisms that are really tall often can't keep a warm temperature enough to survive in, in those colder climates. So they get selected against, where, whereas those shorter plants are closer to the, to the earth. So there's not as much draft, and they can maintain warmer temperatures. So they're more likely to survive and reproduce. And as a matter of fact, when we look at polar bears, another adaptation is polar bears um, are not as tall as your other bears, like your black bears and your brown bears. It's because those smaller polar bears are actually surviving better and reproducing because they are, they are able to regulate their body temperature better than those taller bears are. Let's take a look at the European peppered moth. And we've actually had some changes in the European pepper moth over time. I wanted to show you this. It might be hard to see, but there's actually two different pepper moths in this picture, and there's also two over here. So I don't know how well you can see this on the video. But before the Industrial Revolution, the tree bark that they lived on was covered in lichens. These are the lichens, and you've probably seen lichens before on trees. And the lichens are... Were normally light. 
And these two different, or these moths that are the same species, came in two different colors. The ones that were dark were being selected against. They're being eaten up. It was really hard before the Industrial Revolution to find a dark colored moth of this species. But due to the Industrial Revolution and all the pollution that was being released, the lichens absorbed all that pollution. And as they absorbed that pollution, they darkened up. So it became very rare to find a white colored moth because the predators would pick them off. And we found that we would, there would be more of these black colored moths. So we see a change in allele frequency over time. So the European peppered moth population evolved in a short period of time due to the change in the environment, due to that um, industrial revolution. So going back to our notes here, in some situations, or pre-industrial revolution, moths that were lighter survived better and reproduced. And so then we had a large number of lighter moths in the next generation. But then again, there was a change in the environment, and we then saw that the darker color became more common over time. Let's take a look at this last adaptation. So this is a picture of a moth. And you probably noticed before that this kind of arrangement here. This, these are called eye spots. So let's think about what would be the advantage for moths to have these eye spots. And we also sometimes see eye spots um, on other insects like caterpillars. Well, this is confusing to predators because when you first look at this, it looks like a face. So a predator might think that this is something that could eat them and not necessarily food for them to eat. So eye spots are a way to distract predators. So those that had these eye spots survive better and reproduce. And now we see this adaptation. Again, when you're answering questions about adaptations, we're going to use some logic and reasoning and some background information. So let's look at these last two. Why do seals have three times the amount of hemoglobin compared to other mammals? So you probably know a little bit about hemoglobin. You might think red blood cells, and you probably have the general idea that your red blood cells, your hemoglobin, carry oxygen. So why would they need three times the amount of hemoglobin? Well, if you think of what a seal does, they come to the surface, they take in air, and then they hold their breath as they swim around. So the more hemoglobin they have, the more oxygen they can store, and so they can swim around for a longer period of time before resurfacing. The next example says, why do vice versa butterflies, which are non-toxic, look almost identical to monarchs, which are toxic? So again, the viceroys, they can't consciously like, change themselves so that they become more similar to the monarchs. But what has happened over time is viceroys were born, and they have different variations, different colorations to them. And the viceroys that were born, and they looked more similar to monarchs, those viceroys were more likely to survive and reproduce. Monarchs are toxic, so if a bird eats a monarch, the bird gets sick. And the bird, bird can learn not to eat a butterfly with those, the, that coloration, that pattern to it. And so you can see the advantage. The viceroys that looked like monarchs were not surviving, or were not being eaten, so they were surviving and reproducing. And that type of coloration then gets passed on to the next generation and becomes more common over time. Now, on the next page, I've given you your learning targets, and there's not very many because it's a really short unit. So you might take a second after you get done today listening to this lecture, going through those learning targets. You should now be able to answer all those learning targets, or after you finish the snorkel activity online, then you can study a little bit for your assessment by looking through your learning targets on this page. In addition, you have two things that must be handed in before you go and work on Snorkel Island. We had our bacteria lab that the majority of you had finished by the end of class. And then also we handed this out at the end to review Charles Darwin's four ideas related to natural selection and how natural selection could change a population like the dodo bird population over time, leading to new adaptations that would help them survive an environment. You have the back that you probably need to finish up. How would Lamarck explain how dodo birds evolved over time? We talked about his theory of acquired characteristics. And then down here, then your using common sense logic and reasoning to tell me what this adaptation would provide for this organism living in this environment. So what's the advantage for horses that have long tails? What would be advantage to plants living in a rainforest having broad leaves and so on? Okay, So those assignments need to be done before you open your Chromebooks and go to Snarfle Island.